told me, well, why don't they learn English? These immigrants. Okay, you just told me you don't know any. Because <laughs> they're trying. But you know, if you're a first generation, you're, you're working 24 seven, maybe you're working a couple of jobs, you don't have the energy. You're in survival mode. It's the kids, you see. They're in the schools and it's the kids who learn the language. Yo soy bilingüe. Sin pena. Doy esta charla en español. I can do this any way you want. Este es el idioma de mi madre. This is the language of my mother. And there's Joseph. And then he says things like, you know, when I die, take my bones home. Egypt isn't home. Home is that place far away from which he was taken. There's something in his soul that still reverberates Israel, Canaan. And then, you know, the story tells us that Egyptians despise shepherds. And so when his family comes, Jacob, and the brothers and their families, they put them in a, a part of the delta that was kind of quarantined. They wouldn't have to see them. But there's an interesting scene there as well, you see, because the narrative tells us is that Egyptians hate shepherds. But then what Joseph does, he introduces his father to Pharaoh. See, his father is one of those despised shepherds. He's just a poor Bedouin. What went through Joseph's mind when he presents his dad to Pharaoh? Was he embarrassed? Was he ashamed of his father? And you get that powerful engagement where you see the old man walk over to Pharaoh and he blesses him. What a powerful story. Have you ever thought of Joseph as an immigrant story? How do you read that story? Does it resonate? If it does, how? You work with Hispanic families and the kids are ashamed. They're ashamed of their parents, ashamed of their language, translating for their parents at the school meetings. You go into an Hispanic church and the parents are speaking in Spanish and the kids are speaking in English and the teenagers in the back texting something. The parents will speak to their kids in Spanish and the kids will answer in English. How's that? Living with the shame. So you will read this story and resonate with it as an immigrant in ways that the host culture may not even think of. Esas son nuestras historias. Those are our stories. Estamos en la palabra de Dios. We are in the word of God. We'll come back to the story a bit later. Now if you finish Genesis and just turn the page, you begin another story. The story begins, the first few verses of Exodus, with the people of Israel just multiplying. But it tells us that uh, there arose a pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. 
But the Egyptians are scared. Do you remember why? The numbers. Right? It's an invasion. You hear the language of our media? It's a tsunami. It's the numbers. That scare us. It's natural. There we see it in ancient Egypt. But you know what happens is that we don't know, most of us, that about 15% of the Koreans in this country are undocumented. Did you know that? We have undocumented Canadians and Irishmen, Russians, but the Hispanics, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. It's the numbers that scare us. And so what do you do? You, you put into place a series of legal measures to control the population. It's a very natural kind of move. Very cruel in that case where they're going to kill the little boys because they're afraid that, that Israel will rise up against the Egyptian government. National security problems. But they have these midwives, these very brave women who save the little boys. But then what you see that the Egyptians do is they've been using... Uh, the Israelites for labor, construction, to build their buildings and their monuments. And then they come up with a law that makes no economic sense. You know, you've got to keep the quota of the bricks, but we're going to make it harder for you to build the bricks. You've got to find your own straw. And if you know ancient building practices, the straw would, you know, you, you mix it with the mud because it gives it substance, and when it dries, it's hard. Without the straw, the, the bricks collapse. But what you see is, this doesn't make any economic sense. These bricks are for Egyptian buildings. They're not for the Israelite buildings, which don't have any, really. You would think that the Egyptian government would want to have efficiency, make it actually easier to make bigger, better, faster buildings. Makes no economic sense to put all these laws into place because of the foreign presence. Do you hear the echoes into our time? We need the labor. Who's harvesting our food? Who's building our buildings? Who's doing our landscaping? <laughs> Go into a restaurant and see who's behind the doors, cleaning the dishes and bussing the tables and cooking your food and being the nannies for your kids. We need the labor. We just don't want them. The most tragic immigrant story, if we think about it, are the African Americans. They were brought here to work. We needed their labor. We just didn't want them. We go to civil war over this, actually. 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, but then we come up with segregation. You see, we needed their labor, we just didn't want them. And the story repeats itself with every new wave that comes in. The scripture's a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? these immigrant stories. Who do you resonate with? The Egyptians? Or with the Israelite midwives? 
Where do you stand in that story? Come back to that. Another story, great story, Ruth. I gotta check my time. I could go on. We, we have till like 10.30, is that what? <laughs> Just kidding, I know you want the reception. <laughs> Let me do Ruth, and then I'll do one more real fast. These are great stories, my goodness. Ruth, you know how it begins? Naomi and her family live in Bethlehem and Judah. There's a famine in the land, and so they leave. They're looking for food. They go across the Dead Sea to Moab. And the sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Okay, flip it. What you see is Ruth and Orpah marry immigrants. But then Naomi's uh, husband dies and the two sons die. And now she says, which is very human, you know, I just want to go home. I hear it's better now. And you, Ruth and Orpah, just, you, you stay here and just start over. No, no, you know. But finally, Orpah will decide to stay. But Ruth says, you know, your people will be my people, and, and your God, my God, and I will die with you. If you read the narrative carefully, Naomi says nothing. There's no, thank you, yes, yes, we can do this. Not a word. So they begin the trip back to Judah. And now the woman who had married an immigrant, Ruth, now she becomes the immigrant. And they get to Bethlehem, and all the women of the town come out, and they're weeping, and they're hugging Naomi. And she says, I'm a bitter woman. God has taken away everything from me. And where did that happen? Moab. And now she has a Moabitess with her. It's an awkward scene if you read it carefully. Ruth isn't even mentioned. She's not introduced. So what was that like? Was, was Ruth kind of standing off in the corner, not knowing what to do and what to say? And the women don't even acknowledge her. Chapter 2, she's in the fields working. She has the right to do this as an immigrant. And the wife, uh, a widow of, of an Israelite. And then Boaz shows up. Who, who's that woman? And a lot of times people go, well, you know, she must have been a really good-looking woman. <laughs> he points her out right away. Well, maybe. But maybe she looked different. Maybe she dressed funny. And the workers say, well, she, she's, she's the, the Moabite, and, and she's, she's with Naomi. She's been working all day, hasn't taken a break. Listen to the words. They don't even know her name. Maybe no one's even talked to her all day. They've just watched her. They can't give you her name, but they know what she's like. She's a hard worker. That sounds very immigrant, doesn't it? Boy, those immigrants, well, you know, they work 24-7, you know. They'll work seven days a week. If we need something done, you know, they'll be here on a Sunday morning. They'll work. Yeah. And he calls her over. She comes to him and she bows down to the ground, to her face. I'm a no kriya, the pejorative term for the foreigner. She could have taken a different label. She takes the pejorative term. Was it because she felt just marginalized? Well then, 
Boaz says, look, he says, uh, you've got to be careful with the men, you know. So you, you go over here and work with the women. Uh, okay, I'll do that. And so then she gets home, and, and, and Naomi says, well, how'd it go? Well, you know, I, I met this guy called a Boaz. Oh, he's our kinsman. Oh, God be praised. Yahweh has, you know, given us his favor. And, uh, and he, he, he brought something. Oh, that's wonderful. But let me give you some advice. Uh, Naomi says to Ruth, you know, be careful with those men, you know. You've got to work with the women. Oh, yeah. That's good. I'll do that. She's already been doing it. Chapter 3. She's supposed to meet Boaz at the threshing floor. And if you read the narrative again carefully, uh, Naomi says, now, you let him do all the talking. Okay. You read the narrative, and Ruth is telling Boaz what to do. This is a very resourceful immigrant, you see. Navigating her way forward in this foreign world. And then in chapter 4, Boaz marries her, and the elders of the town will praise her like some of the, the, the great women of Israel's past, and even the women, you see, say to her, you know, she, they say to, to Naomi, she loves you more than seven sons. And Naomi says, nothing. But now there's a child. His name is Obed. And they hand her the child. And they say, you know, this child, when he gets older, he'll take care of you. And Naomi takes the child. Maybe now she'll fully embrace her foreign daughter-in-law. Maybe now things will be better. It's the children who are the bridge. See? And then there's Ovid, the half-breed. Father from Judah, a mother from Moab. I'm sure he didn't have to go through what his mother went through. And from him will come ultimately King David, it tells us at the end of the book. There's a story there too, you see. I'm Obed. I'm a half-breed. Medio Chapin, medio gringo. Half Guatemala and half American. I didn't have to go through what my mother went through. I can speak English, no accent. Six foot six, gringo face, I'm good to go. <laughs> but we're out there. Where do you resonate in this story? Are you Boaz? Is there a Ruth in this room? Any other Obeds around? Where are you in that story? Last one, then I want to move to some conclusions. Isn't this good stuff? Daniel. We often just miss so many things in the story. He's taken away to Babylon before Judah falls. So from afar, he will hear about the invasion. <clears throat> He's educated, which means he probably comes from a very well-to-do family. He obviously can read and write. Very, very few people could do that at the time. So well-heeled, well-educated, probably from a family of means. And then the reports start coming in. See, Jerusalem has been taken. The walls have come down. The temple has been burned. How much family did he lose in the war? 
how many friends. Everything his family had is gone. They've even given him another name. What was it like? They've taken everything from him. And they've killed his family, for goodness sake. He's a thousand miles from home. And they change his name, and then they train him for the empire. They train him to serve the very empire that destroyed his country and leveled his capital city and took everything from him. Now he must serve them. What was that like? You ever read it that way? And then he says something that's very interesting. He says, you know, let us eat our own food. He's food's a cultural marker. <laughs> right? If you want to know if you're in a, I don't know about Abilene. I just arrived last night. <laughs> <laughs> but in Denver <laughs> or in Metro Chicago, if you want to know what ethnic you know, neighborhood you're in, look at the restaurants. You know, if you see taquerias and pupuserias and panaderias, okay, you're in the Hispanic part. Okay? Now, I always tell this story. It's a great story. It's a true story. Um, you know, when I was in Denver, I haven't done this yet in, in, in Wheaton, so I might do this if I can. But I would take students to Guatemala about every other year. And what I would tell them is this. I said, you know, in Guatemala, we eat black beans, frijol negro. And we can do it any way you want. We can do, uh, like, whole bean, you know, frijol parado. We can do arroz con, you know, con frijol. We can do beans and rice. We can do bean soup. We can do, you know, frijol volteado. Where's the Guatemalan? I met him. Hombre, frijol volteado. You, know, you kind of mash the bean, and you, and you fry it, and you flip it, and it looks like a meatloaf and you slice it, and you put the white goat cheese on it with the salsita, or as they say in this country, salsa. <laughs> this actually happened to me at least twice. Do you have any salsa? What? Do you have any salsa? Yeah, we got that. <laughs> so I tell all the students, you know, you know, beans do stuff, so <laughs> you got to get, like, in training for this. <laughs> right? I don't know what kind of restaurant you have here, so I hope one of these works. They go, oh, we got a Cadoba, we do Chipotle. Do you have those here? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, because you know, in Guatemala, you can have it, Los Tres Tiempos, you can have beans three meals a day. You know, for me, some beans and some toast and coffee, I'm good to go for breakfast. It was always, I could just clock it. They'd fly in on a Saturday night. I'd meet them at the airport by Wednesday. Always on the Wednesday. Things begin to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Carroll, for the love of God, can we go to McDonald's, please? <laughs> and I would go, okay, um, I'll tell you what, tonight we'll do, we'll do pizza and saw me. Pizza in a movie. All right? I'll pay. Dr. Carroll's great. So right outside the, the seminary, you know, walk out the main gate, right to the right, there's a, a, a Domino's pizza, a walk-in, not a sit-down. So I'd say, look, I want to get the pizza. You all just wait. What they didn't know, this actually has changed, which is sad, because it was a wonderful thing I, I could do then, but uh, it doesn't happen anymore. But there was this time when Guatemala may have been the only place in the world where you could get black bean pizza. <laughs> And so I kind of come in with a stack of pizzas. <laughs> just a small one, just, just for the effect. But it's the food, you see. Why do they want McDonald's? It's the food. What is Daniel saying? You may change our names. You may take away everything that we have. 
but we are Jews. And he is willing, and his friends are willing to die for their faith, marked by their food. You ever read Daniel like that? There are other stories, but I need to get to my last slide. And what I want to do is just ask questions. The virtues and the stories that we just read. To begin to think about immigration in a different kind of way. Not just about right, wrong, consequences, which you have to get to. The good. What is the good in these stories? And for whom? What is the good for the Babylonian government? The good for these young men. Well, what is the good for Boaz? The good for Ruth? The good for Naomi? And what are the virtues do we see exemplified in the stories as they try to move toward the good? Courage, long suffering, patience, kindness, compassion. Loyalty. And how can these stories, once we begin to identify the characters and identify their virtues and begin to see ourselves in their lives, how do those stories begin to shape our own moral reasoning and wisdom? And what kind of community will be shaped by this kind of thinking about the virtues? And what kind of practices do we need in our churches to begin to nurture a people of patience, a people of kindness, a people of empathy, a people of long-suffering, people of justice. Read these stories with the lens of the virtues, and maybe the whole conversation about immigration begins to change. Immigrant stories all over the place in the Old Testament and the New. The Bible's full of it. We are created to multiply and to fill the earth. How do we fill the earth? Because we move. <laughs> the history of humanity is the history of migration. We we're just in another episode now. How does the church respond, especially when so many of those immigrants who come now are our brothers and sisters in the Lord? How do we become a people of virtue to grapple with this in ways that our politics cannot understand. To be the right kind of people in the name of the gospel. Tomorrow, what we're gonna do in chapel is look at Old Testament law. Can Old Testament law teach us some things about immigration? Rich discussions, aren't they? Isn't the Bible awesome? <laughs> it is. I want to thank you for your patience, and now I turn it over to I don't know who. Do I pray or do I <laughs> dance? What do <are> you <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol Rodas, for telling stories, old stories that turn out to be new stories that hold up a mirror to our culture and to our church. And in the mirror, we see the immigrant in a fresh way. And in the mirror, we are asked to imagine the way that God sees the immigrant. 
We are so honored that uh, these uh, young women and men are here. They have been selected by their universities, by their deans, by their faculty as outstanding students who particularly have an interest in ethics. And so they have come to our campus as young Maston scholars. And their being here represents a future that God is imagining and creating within them. We want to introduce them to you individually, and Dr. Wernz will present them with a certificate suitable for framing and uh, with a book. And by the way, we have another book for you, uh, another book by Dr. Maston that we'll give to you tomorrow at lunch. The book you are presented is Biblical Ethics, his, uh, Dr. Maston's classic work. So as I call your name, if you'll please uh, come up and we'll, we'll uh, present you to the group and present some things to you and then we'll hold our applause for all uh, when we have finished. First, from the Baptist University of the Americas, we have Marduchi Estenville. And uh, secondly, uh, also from Baptist University of the Americas, Dominique Lopez. And two from uh, Dallas Baptist University, Jacob Abels. And Jordan Wicker. From East Texas Baptist University, Connor Guthrie and James Ash. Two from Hardin Simmons University, who get the award for coming the shortest distance today, Madison Bobbles and Carlo Serna. Two from Houston Baptist University, Beth Zimmerman and Cadence Tripp. Two from Howard Payne University, Jordan Pittman and Cecily McElwain. Two from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, Merrick Reyes and Ashley Gregory. And two from Wayland Baptist University, Anita Salazar and Eric Dexter II. Would you express your appreciation for them? <laughs> the church will be in their hands. And we see in them such great promise and such great possibility. When we uh, finish this evening, we'll have a photograph here at the front, so we'll ask you, you who are young Maston scholars to uh, uh, come up for that photograph as we finish. Let me give you a little reminder of uh, what's to come. As already mentioned several times by our speaker, there's a reception tonight. Um, when we finish, just across the hallway in the reception room are a few goodies. And if you can't tell, Dr. Carol Rodas is a people person. He loves to meet people and talk with people, so it'll be a great opportunity for some personal conversation with him. You'll notice there's some artwork in the reception room and in the foyer done by Hardin Simmons University art students in recognition of the International Day of Women, which is this next Thursday and is being celebrated on our campus. 
Tomorrow morning, the second lecture is at 9.30, not here, but in Barron's Auditorium, the large auditorium. And then for Young Masson Scholars at 10.30 in the reception room, you'll have an, an hour to have conversation with uh, Dr. Carol Rodas. And then we will have lunch, and all of us have dialogue with our speaker in the Johnson Building Multipurpose Room. So all of you who are normally a part of our weekly Thursday Logson Community Luncheons, we have a place for you, for young Masson scholars, for alumni, for the Masson Foundation. And because it's Texas, we ordered extra food. So anybody who's hungry, come on. I bet, uh, I bet we'll have enough for, for you. And uh, we'll have some good conversation, some unpacking and discussing of what all of this means. It has been a good day. And for our good word, our benediction, Dr. Larry Baker will come, someone who is uh, experienced in ethics, someone who comes along trained in the Maston tradition, our director of the Doctor of Ministry program, and, uh, and a good friend. Dr. Baker, please. Now let's stand for prayer. Now let's pray. God of the prophets, through whom you comfort the troubled and trouble the comforted, let us feel the troubling presence of your prophets in our midst. Give us the vision to recognize them the courage to hear them, and the will to heed them. And may we go from this place tonight in the name of God the Creator, whose strength empowers us to do his work in our world. May we go in the name of Christ the Redeemer, whose love transforms us and uses us to love our world and its people as he loves us. May we go in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose presence guides us into the paths of justice and mercy, love and need. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.